Okay, morning everyone. Uh, welcome to day three, which is the last day uh, of our um, AI at Surrey Summer School. And uh, this morning we're really going to be focusing on different application areas of AI. So you'll have a have chance uh, yesterday afternoon to see some specific applications in the demonstrations that you saw. Uh, but here we're going to look at uh, things like uh, sounds and vision, uh, medical applications and so on. But first, uh, to kick us off, uh, Sasha Kerslovich from Audio Analytic will be talking about applications in audio. So, Sasha, over <laughs> Thank to you, Mark. Uh, yes, so I'm, uh, I'm Sasha Kostorovic, I'm the Director of Research at Company Audio Analytic, which is located in Cambridge. Uh, before I start, I just uh, want to say that I really enjoyed this summer school so far. I think it was really high quality, so I want to thank again Adrian, uh, Mark, uh, Helen, and everybody involved into the organization, because that has been uh, really, really high quality uh, so far. So I'm going to have to live up to it. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the, for the invitation today. Uh, just a very quick uh, in, uh, introduction to uh, audio analytics. So uh, a simple way to explain what our company is doing is like a Shazam for real world sounds. That's not technically accurate. We don't use fingerprinting technique. We use uh, machine learning for uh, sound recognition. But that's a simple way to explain what the company is doing to the general public. Uh, essentially, uh, we produce software and technology which gives machine the broader sense of hearing. Uh, and that's based on machine learning. We use lots of data. Uh, most of it we have recorded uh, ourselves uh, to provide that uh, uh, artificial sense of hearing to machines. And our, a sense of hearing in a broad sense, which encompasses uh, speech music, but uh, importantly, all the other sounds, uh, dog barks, uh, glass breaks, and so on. Um, so this is you. This is your devices. So you might have a smart speaker at home. Uh, like Amazon Echo or uh, uh, Apple HomePod or that kind of devices. Or uh, nowadays, uh, headphones have enough computing power to run uh, artificial intelligence on board the, the headphones. They're called uh, hearables. Uh, cars are becoming smarter and smarter. Your smartphone is already smart, but has lots of computing power into it. And your home might have devices like smart thermostats or uh, smart objects in general, cameras, DIY uh, security systems, which are able to run uh, artificial intelligence in particular for audio. And so what uh, our software does, it runs onto those devices uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, useful applications related to the detection of sounds. So it could be kitchen sounds, it could be glass break, uh, it can be uh, pet sounds, it can be uh, pretty much uh, any sound you, you, you can think of. Um, uh, this uh, is an idea of, uh, this is a big market, as in uh, you're going to have by 2021 uh, 230 million smart home devices, you're going to have 206 million smart speakers uh, in people's homes, uh, 82 million hearables, 92 million connected cars, uh, and 1.7 billion smartphones. Um, and we had this uh, market uh, analyst uh, who uh, was kind enough to say sound recognition is a key strategic technology that should be made available in all connected devices to give them that uh, in intelligence. Uh, the, the idea here is uh, it's a big market and uh, so we've talked about societal aspects of AI. Uh, one of the very simple ways to, to change the world is also to uh, improve the economy. So uh, when you become successful at selling artificial intelligence, you create jobs, you pay tax and you make something useful for people. Buying something is a way to, uh, to uh, convey, I mean selling something to people is a way to uh, uh, disseminate the usefulness of AI. A very simple way to do that. Right, now I'm not here to tell you about uh, audio analytics specifically or uh, about uh, the economic impact of AI. What I'm here to tell you about today is the applications of AI to audio. Uh, so let's start with a little quiz. Uh, good morning everyone. How many intelligent actions involving audio can you find into the short dialogue below? So please talk to me, tell me <laughs> how many can you see? Anybody? Yes? All of them. Say again, sorry? All of them. All of them, yes, but uh, can you name some intelligent actions? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you see that's intelligent and that's dealing with audio in this dialogue? Uh, for example, emotion detection. Emotion detection, yeah, she sounds happy, so that's one of the tasks. Some kinds of uh, topic uh, classification, or you could say like uh, detection of some specific uh, parts. Yes, okay, so the uh, pop song would be uh, genre, music genre recognition. What else do we have? 
She sounds happy. She sounds happy, so that's emotion again, yeah. Voice recognition, because they can tell that it's Auntie Barbara. Yes, uh, so that Auntie Barbara would be speaker recognition, and then voice recognition, yes, because this is a dialogue. So if we, if we run through uh, all the intelligent functions in there, so we have dialogue, which itself can be broken down into speech recognition and speech synthesis. Um, we have uh, attention, what's that sound? So you can imagine applications where the detection of certain sounds trigger a certain action, a camera moving into a certain action. As humans, when we cross the road, if we hear a car, we're going to pay attention to that. Speaker identification that you correctly uh, spotted. Um, sound source separation. Uh, Bonti Barbara is singing while frying an egg, so there are two sounds overlapping and we're able to tell that, that both sounds are happening and that they represent different things. Uh, frying eggs per se is sound event recognition. It's not speech, so mu not music, it's a sound, but frying eggs in that instance. Uh, sound source localization, that sound com comes from the, from the kitchen. She sounds happy, emotion recognition. Uh, pop song, music genre recognition, that's Shakira, so music fing fingerprinting, re recognizing which track is playing. Uh, and voice commands, please close the kitchen door, um, will you? So in that case, a command to a human, but it could be a command to your smart speaker. So just in that five lines of dialogue, we can find 10 different tasks related to uh, intelligence in, in audio. So you can imagine how happy I was when Mark and Helen asked me to cover that in 45 minutes plus question, but I'm going to try to do my best. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of domain knowledge, what is it that distinguishes um, uh, image recognition or uh, uh, you know, other areas of AI that we've, that we've uh, seen uh, over the past days from uh, audio? So speech and music have long been top research interests in, in audio AI, uh, all the way back to 1791, uh, where von Kempelen tried to make a speech synthesizer made of wood and pieces of uh, leather and so on. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, speech, uh, ability to speak and ability also to produce art and music have been something that's been of interest because that distinguished us from uh, animals. Uh, now, so, so the interest for speech and music has really uh, uh, impersonated the uh, AI, AI for uh, audio for a long time. Um, and uh, behind that, there is that source plus filter models have long dominated the reasoning about sound analysis and synthesis because people were mostly interested in speech and music. Uh, so when I speak about uh, source plus filter uh, model, uh, so uh, the, the vocal tract itself has a, a excitation, vocal cords are producing a kind of a specific vibration and that vibration is being shaped by the vocal tract which is a resonator and because we can change the shape of the vocal tract we can uh, modulate uh, these waves to produce phonemes and so on uh, and we have other mechanisms to produce vowels and consonants and so on. So uh, in music instruments work in a similar way where you have a mostly an excitation source for brass instruments is the reed or the mouthpiece, for uh, uh, string instruments is the vibration of the chords, and that uh, uh, excitation is being shaped by the, 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 the shape of the instrument. Uh, hence the uh, popularity of these kind of models where signal processing models where you have a signal generator for the excitation and then a shaping filter uh, for the uh, music notes or, or speech. Uh, and the synthesized signal is the convolution of the signal generator and the shaping filter. I think John uh, spoke about convolution uh, yesterday. Um, so, uh, concrete example is the melt frequency gaps from coefficients are indeed a, a spectrum envelope model and they are some of the acoustic features, I'll come back to what acoustic features are, which are very popular in the uh, music, uh, in, the, in the sound analysis in general. Uh, auditory models have also been considered but yielded uh, limited benefits. Uh, some successful examples of what uh, the study of uh, how the ear works um, are uh, MEL scale. So MEL scale is a logarithmic uh, analysis scale of, uh, of, of audio, uh, which is related to uh, how the uh, acoustic filters are shaped into the cochlea, into the, 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 the basic organ of hearing uh, in, in, the, in humans. Uh, gamma tone filters brought uh, this logic further. They may, they they uh, implement filters which are much more uh, akin to what's happening in the cochlea. I've seen publications where gamaton filters were bringing improvements uh, over the MELT scale, but because uh, they are a bit more computationally expensive than uh, standard filters, uh, uh, they, they, ha they haven't been widespread. Uh, another example of features which make use of uh, acoustic knowledge are the Rasta PLP features where uh, loudness curves are being used for the analysis of audio at the signal processing level. 
so this is where basic knowledge of how uh, sounds are produced or uh, uh, heard uh, helps with uh, the, the analysis of sounds. Uh, things which are important in terms of domain knowledge are also understanding of the uh, room reverberation and room acoustic effect effects in general. They matter a lot for uh, audio applications. Uh, every different surface in a room has different reflection coefficients, so you might have more reflections from the walls, less from the ceiling, less from the carpet, and so on. Um, and beyond, river, beyond reverberation, the room itself uh, is a filter. Um, so just like instruments uh, shape uh, the, the sounds, the, the shape of a room can uh, 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 boost certain frequencies or uh, tame some uh, other frequencies. And it's important to understand that when you uh, define your, uh, your problem, your task that you're trying to solve with AI. Uh, Non-harmonic sounds are understudied. Um, there is not a lot of publication specifically targeted at the acoustics of, of crashes and bangs. Um, this picture is uh, us breaking windows when we recorded a database necessary to train a system able to rec uh, recognize a real window breaks. And uh, one of the issues is that uh, uh, actually producing a bang is a way to measure the uh, acoustic response of a room because you do a, an impulse uh, in, in, the, in the room and what comes back is actually the, 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 the filtering uh, response of the room. So um, non-harmonic sounds as in crash and bangs are uh, really difficult to, uh, to deal with because you have to get rid of all the uh, room effects. Uh, in principle, all these effects that we're talking about, the production and so on, the room response, it all ends up into the data. Uh, and early on, people were trying, like 10, 20 years ago, to make uh, sophisticated uh, uh, expert models of how certain sounds are produced. This is, for example, a, a, a physic, uh, I mean, an electroacoustic model of uh, how uh, the uh, vocal tract works, where uh, they used uh, electronic analogies for uh, the production of the excitation, then the physical uh, models for the vocal uh, cords, and then the tube model uh, with all the physics model of how things resonate inside the tube. Uh, so either you do that or uh, you learn an approximation of the complex function that, that this kind of physical system realizes from the data. And that's where machine learning became very successful because you didn't need to uh, have a very uh, complex uh, understanding of all the uh, frication, say for speech, uh, frication uh, uh, phenomena uh, when you're producing uh, consonants. Uh, you could just uh, use a, a data and a, a machine learning system to learn that function from the data. You didn't need to have the expert knowledge anymore on these things. Hence the interest for machine learning, the, uh, phasing out the complicated uh, models. Uh, now you still need um, data intuition. Uh, and the idea here is the following. Uh, the data representation matters. Uh, and the acoustic feature space, uh, but the acoustic feature space with more than three dimensions are hard to visualize. Uh, if we simplify this, this if we make a thought experiment, um, uh, if our data had only two features, so for acoustics, if it was only, say, the pitch and the, uh, say, harmonicity of the sound, you could represent it in a two-dimensional plane. And the best case scenario, your data uh, is uh, linearly separable. We've seen that in, in previous uh, sessions uh, in this, uh, uh, in, in this um, summer school. Uh, but uh, uh, it might not be the case that it's as simple as linearly separable. Your data might happen to be separable by a polynomial instead or uh, your uh, data might be uh, intricately kind of mixed up in ways which are completely nonlinear, where you can't formulate a simple mathematical function to, uh, to uh, separate them. And then in some cases, your data might not even be separa separable by a continuous uh, line or curve. Uh, you might need highly nonlinear uh, 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 separators to be able to uh, classify things. Uh, in, your, uh, in your data space. So that's just two dimension, but uh, uh, acoustic data is uh, multi-dimensional and you can use a lot of uh, features to represent that acoustic data. Now this, you can't visualize it. Uh, this is a 2D uh, reduction of uh, the uh, data database that we have for sounds. Um, um, 
it's using a method called uh, UMAP to do the dimensionality re reduction. Uh, so uh, actually this has a lot more uh, dimensions than this diagram, but this just gives you an idea that this, uh, uh, the way sounds, variety of sounds are uh, intricated into the, uh, into the acoustic space, uh, is, uh, that, that's very complex, that's very non-linear. It's not something that uh, a priori you can use a, a linear separator for. Um, so, realizing that we are dealing with audio data can help. Um, so, sorry, one more thing about this is that uh, kernel methods were uh, aimed at kind of untangling the uh, non-linearity of these spaces, um, but uh, uh, that's not the only way to kind of draw lines into this kind of this, this kind of, the, the, um, acoustic space. Right. So, realizing that we are dealing with audio data can help to make sense of your acoustic space. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that um, uh, you want to work uh, in, a, in a space where the distance between different sounds, uh, the mathematical definition that you use for the distance between sounds, you might want that to be as consistent as possible with the uh, acoustic uh, notion of distance. Um, if you use a spectrum, for example, if you were uh, making a Euclidean distance between spectra, you might have two spectra where the uh, peaks, where the frequencies are just slightly shifted, uh, and humans would recognize those two sounds where the frequencies are slightly shifted as being very close to each other. It's almost the same note or almost the same dog bark or whatnot. But in the sense of the Euclidean distance uh, between spectra, those two sounds would be very far away in Euclidean distance. So what you want is you want to work in a space uh, where uh, closed sounds are close in the sense of some distance. Um, Mel Kepstrom is really good uh, from the standpoint of sounds which are perceptually close happen to be also very uh, perceptually close in, uh, in, um, the, uh, in Euclidean dis distance in the Mel uh, spectrum um, space. That's a study which dates back from the 1976 and it's a bit of a shame because some of these things were really um, uh, seminal works and have been a bit forgotten in the modern times because you know it's from the 70s but uh, Markel, Gray and Markel in 76 made those experiments where they were trying to find which distance and which acoustic space works best for separating sounds and they concluded that the spectrum uh, <coughs> space was really good for that. Um, so, uh, uh, if you have a machine learning algorithm which is able to draw any nonlinear manifold, then feature design can become part of model optimization. You both want to find your best uh, 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 machine learning algorithm, but uh, that uh, uh, notion of best machine learning algorithm also works hand in hand with notion of best representation of your data, which maximizes the potential of your uh, machine learning algorithm. So, what you're looking for is the right model given the data properties. And that's where domain knowledge is important. Um, research uh, used to be partly about finding the right data projection given a particular model. So kernel methods were about finding the right projection to be able to, to uh, separate uh, your data points uh, with, uh, with simple uh, mathematical curves. Um, um, and uh, it used to be that kernel methods were uh, aimed at finding a space where things are linearly separable or, or uh, separable with maximum simplicity. So uh, it's not uh, really the, the, the case anymore. It's still important to question, uh, to understand what you're doing in your data space and how you, you represent your data. But nowadays, um, uh, things tend to be uh, uh, monopolized by neural networks, and I'm going to tell you why. So early on, AI system based on experts who have been outperformed by machine learning. And uh, you used to have a plethora of, of machine learning algorithms. And what distinguishes various machine learning algorithms is the type of curves and types of shapes that they can draw draw into uh, your uh, feature space. So uh, if you take decision trees, they're only able to draw boxes. Uh, if you take support vector machines, the kernel trick was about finding the mathematical transformation that was going to make your uh, separation line, the margin, uh, uh, linear. Uh, if you take Gaussian mixture models, uh, their mathematical definition uh, uh, induces that they can only draw parabolas or combination of parabolas in your uh, acoustic uh, space. You can make fairly complex shapes by uh, combining parabolas, but it's uh, uh, limited to be parabolas. With neural networks, the more neurons you put, the more you can uh, make nonlinear shapes uh, in ways that don't have to be linear or don't have to be parabolic. You can draw pretty much any shape uh, in your acoustic space with, with a neural network. 
So uh, across time, DNS have become a, a quasi-monopoly. Uh, from uh, Perceptron was invented in 1958. Backpropagation uh, came out uh, a few years later, 85. Uh, in 2010, the backpropagation of complex architecture became practical um, for big networks thanks to uh, uh, GPU computing, uh, repurposing uh, graphical processing units to do parallel uh, uh, operations when training DNS. And DNNs at this stage started beating uh, every other uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, and nowadays, DNN architecture are becoming uh, increasingly sophisticated. So you have your convolutive nets, recurrent nets, LSTM, and so on. John talked about that yesterday. But why are DNNs so successful? Uh, there are clear reasons uh, for that. Uh, so as I said, they are nonlinear and they have lots of parameters, uh, and uh, therefore lots of degrees of freedom. So they can fit arbitrarily complex nonlinear uh, functions uh, in, in principle. If you train them well, then they can approximate pretty much anything. Uh, and in spite of being nonlinear and, and having large number of parameters, DNN optimization is tractable on large amounts of data thanks to backpropagation. So support vector machines, for example, are also nonlinear and I also have uh, uh, lots of parameters, but uh, uh, to train them, the, the, mat uh, the mathematical formulation makes them very, very computationally expensive, whereas backpropagation uh, makes that uh, tractable. Uh, DNNs also are discriminatively trained. So discriminative training means that they, are, they uh, um, actively seek to uh, uh, optimize the separation of your different classes in your, in your feature space, which is an advantage. Um, and DNNs directly uh, estimate the pro posterior probability of your classes. So the, that probability of the label, it's a dog, versus the probability of the input sound, uh, woof, uh, is uh, uh, being directly estimated by the uh, DNNs, which is in contrast to Gaussian mixture models or generative models where you were, you were estimating a likelihood and then uh, remodeling that with the uh, uh, prior probabilities to get to the posterior. Um, so all of that uh, are, are very good reasons why uh, DNNs are being preferred to other um, uh, machine learning algorithms in, in modern times. So there is something which is interesting, which is a bit of the kind of what's the next stage? Okay, we have DNNs, but are they what are they evolving towards? And uh, there is that notion of differentiable programming, also known as software v version 2.0. Uh, pardon the the, the 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 amount of text in this slide, but it's the, this is a quote from uh, Yann Lequin, the director of uh, Facebook at uh, the director of Facebook AI research. He says, "Deep learning and more with differential pro differentiable programming, people are now building a new kind of software by assembling networks of parameterized functional blocks." and by training them from examples using f some form of gradient-based optimization. It's really very much like a regular program, except it's parameterized, automatically differentiated, and tra trainable slash optimizable. So the notion here is that you don't just uh, use one type of neural network. You, you assemble different uh, uh, architectures of neural networks, assuming that each of them performs a particular function. And it doesn't even have to be neural networks. Uh, some people are doing uh, uh, work uh, in, I think it's in the domain of uh, compiler uh, research, uh, where you can uh, program a, a block which doesn't have the ma mathematical uh, form of a, uh, of a neural network. It's not a series of uh, uh, linear algebraic operations with getting functions. It's something else, but it's trainable with a gradient descent algorithm. Uh, Andre Carpati, senior director of AI at Tesla, is saying pretty much the same thing, but with different brand name. He says the classical stack of software 1.0 is what we're all familiar with. It is written in languages such as Python, C++, and so on. By writing each line of code, the program identifies a specific point in program space with some desirable behavior. In contrast, software 2.0 approach is to specify some goal on the behavior of a desired program. Uh, so satisfy a data set of uh, output pairs of examples. For example, input-output pairs of examples. You're, you're making a function that associates input to output or win a game of Go. And write a rough select skeleton of the code, uh, either, uh, so for example, a neural net architecture, but it doesn't have to be that, that identifies a, a subset of program space to search and uh, use the computational resource at our disposal to search this space for a program that works. And the search process can be made efficient with backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent. So again, the, the idea here is that neural networks are a form of uh, programming through data. You assemble functional blocks, uh, you, you, you train them with gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent and you get a program that does something for you. So what are the typical functional blocks of an uh, audio uh, AI system? Uh, you have roughly four blocks. 
uh, in most systems. Uh, you have the front end feature extraction, uh, or which builds the observation space. So most of the time it uses a fast Fourier transform to get to the spectrum of the sounds. So the frequency comp components that are, that are making your sounds. Um, then uh, it transformed the uh, spectrum uh, into uh, mel frequency capsule coefficients, which are a space suitable for Euclidean distance. Uh, it doesn't have to be mel frequency capsule coefficients. It could be all sorts of other features derived either from the uh, Fourier transform, from the frequency analysis, or from the time uh, domain analysis of sounds. Uh, sometimes instead of using FFTs, uh, now you have uh, DNN-based feature extraction. So bottleneck features are an example of uh, DNN-based feature extraction. When you train a, train a network, uh, it's called an autoencoder. You, you put the, uh, the same thing at the input and at the output, and you uh, uh, organize the topology of net your network to have a constriction at the middle of the network. And that's a form of dimensionality reduction. You, once you've trained that, you cut your network in the middle and you use that uh, the, 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 the um, parameters coming out of the bottleneck as your uh, analysis feature features. <coughs> Sorry. And that's all uh, <coughs> trained in an unsupervised way. Pardon me. <coughs> so all of that aims to do some form of dimensionality reduction from the waveform, which has lots of samples. At 16 kilohertz, you have 16,000 parameters per second. Uh, so that's a high dimension observation to something smaller, where for a window of, say, 25 milliseconds of audio, you're going to have 12, 15 MFCCs or uh, uh, 10 bottleneck features or something like that. So the, the, the front end does the dimensionality reduction to build the observation space where you're going to separate your sounds with uh, machine learning. Uh, then you uh, usually have a module uh, which is the acoustic model or the acoustic classifier. That's where the separation of things into this acoustic space uh, happens. Uh, it aims to separate things. Um, and uh, it works. Uh, each point in, in the space where you're working is usually uh, uh, the features corresponding to a short window of audio, typically 25 milliseconds long. Um, then uh, you can have a longer term model. So in the case of speech recognition, it can be a language model. In the case of music, it can be bags of, bag of frames approach, where you, you're looking at things on the longer term. Uh, for sound recognition, uh, we uh, sometimes look at longer term structures. So whereas your little uh, data points cover uh, 25 milliseconds, a dog bark is, on average, uh, a third of a second long, or a baby cry can be up to 1, 1 1.5 second long. So you need something that's going to pull your local uh, decision, uh, classification decisions on all of your data points, uh, 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 going to pull that into a longer term structure. And then you have a last module, which is the, the scoring or the decision per se. So converting the scores that you get from your mathematical models into a label, into a discrete symbol. So either it's a hard decision, so that's anti Barbara, or it can be a soft decision. It has 60% chance of being a Shakira song, for example, or you could deliver an end best list. Uh, so it's a higher chance is Shakira, or it could be Rihanna, or it could be Madonna. Uh, in the case of speech recognition, you can uh, deliver the end best transcriptions uh, of speech and let your uh, user choose which ones they, they want to use. So let's have a look uh, at a fine example of software 2.0 in the domain of uh, speech recognition. So end-to-end -end speech recognition um, refers to end-to-end DNN-based uh, speech recognition. So that's the uh, deep speech model, which was uh, invented by Baidu in uh, 2016. I think now there are deep, deep speech tr three, so the new generation is coming out this year. Uh, but uh, in that, uh, this is a massive uh, uh, DNN with uh, different types of layers uh, assembled. So you have one, uh, so you, they start from the spectrogram. Uh, then they have a few layers of 1D or 2D invariant convolution, which are uh, thought to, which are designed to do the feature extraction. It's difficult to prove that they're actually doing feature extraction, but the, the thinking behind the design is that these type of uh, networks are doing dimensionality reduction and pulling the information in a way that creates your uh, acoustic space. And then they have a series of recurrent uh, or GRU uh, bidirectional uh, recurrent networks uh, to model the long-term uh, statistics of words, sentences, and so on. They have a fully connected network to package all that information into continuous scores. And then at the end of it, they have a CTC uh, 
layer uh, which does the following thing. So if you see this is the uh, speech waveform, uh, these are the scores, uh, continuous scores that would be, so the, the posterior, the, sorry, the, the, yes, the posterior probabilities that would be coming out of the fully connected layer. So they're continuous things where you have a, so that's the sentence does sound off. So where you have the sound how uh, a phoneme you would have the, uh, that class uh, getting the, the biggest score. But what the CTC uh, layer does, it uh, summarizes these continuous scores into uh, um, uh, one uh, spike. Uh, and because it's just one spike, it's more uh, akin to a, a symbol than a continuous score. So it packages those long term uh, statistics into a uh, instantaneous decision about uh, the various phonemes. And the breakthrough there that made end-to-end uh, uh, -end speech recognition, DNN-based end-to-end recognition possible was uh, this connectionist temporal classification. <coughs> Whereas in uh, uh, old school uh, methods, you needed to have a decoder. Uh, here you can use the uh, CTC network to get directly to the uh, phonemes as the, as the output of the, of, the, of the full decoding from the waveform. This is really powerful, and this is a, uh, an example of software 2.0 where you take a variety of DNS archi architectures, put them together, pre-train some of them, but then you end up putting them together and back, back propagating the whole thing. Let's look at what's going on in uh, speech synthesis. So speech synthesis came up uh, a few years ago, like a couple of years ago, uh, with um, what's called the wave nets. Uh, which are really interesting because they learned, they undertook to, to learn uh, the statistics of speech directly from the waveform. Uh, so there you don't have a, a feature extraction uh, module. Um, the uh, input of the network is, the network has two inputs. One of the inputs is the previous samples. You predict the next sample of your speech waveform given all the samples that were coming before that. Uh, it's a recurrent model, so it's, it aims at looking at a, a large horizon uh, of past samples of speech. And then the output is uh, speech uh, samples uh, as well. Uh, if you let that run without the second input, you get a speech which, um, uh, which you, you get the sounds of speech, you get some form of babble, but it's undirected. Hence the second type of uh, input, which is syntactic and phonetic features from text analysis to drive the synthesis. Uh, I would really encourage you, uh, w when you have time, I, I think we're going to uh, 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 give you, disseminate the slides of this summer school, so you will have a, a chance to, to click on these links. But uh, on the DeepMind, uh, there is a DeepMind blog post about that, where they give samples of the, uh, what is achieved uh, with uh, WaveNets. Uh, and you can hear when the uh, 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 recursive uh, synthesis of speech is undirected. It sounds like speech, but you can't really make any sense of it. Um, and once you um, inject the synthetic and phonetic features then that drives this acoustic model to produce uh, meaningful speech. Uh, so again it's a ex example of software oops sorry software 2.0 in that you have a, a, a mix of uh, diluted uh, 1D uh, convolutive nets you have some non-linearities in there and then some kind of network architecture which makes all of that possible. Let's look at the task of speaker recognition. So um, now the interesting thing about speech, speaker recognition is that uh, the task, uh, uh, the, the idea here which is going to surface is that uh, uh, the task uh, um, is important, Defi definition of the task matters. In speaker recognition you don't have huge databases of the speech of one particular speaker to train your model. Most of the applications require the, the system to work with only one passphrase or a very short uh, utterance. And to the um, nowadays, uh, people are trying to do speaker recognition from the uh, wake word in, in smart speakers. So the, your Hey Siri, OK Google, um, I don't know what's the big Bixby wake word, but it's a very small utterance uh, uh, available to uh, recognize who is speaking. However, it's text dependent. You know what people are going to say. So you can take advantage of uh, the fact that, that you know the phonetic structure of the entrance. But there is uh, quite a variety of tasks uh, in speaker recognition. So from diarization, where you have a long recording with various people talking and you're trying to segment uh, 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 the, the speaking turns of various people. So for that, you have lots of data to model, uh, to, to make your decision of who is uh, speaking. Two uh, long-ish passphrases. Some applications let people define their 
their own passphrases. So you could say, uh, hello, my name is Sasha, as, as the passphrase, which is quite a lot of phonetic contents, down to keyword only, where you have a very, very small amount of audio to make your decision. And uh, as I said, that can be text dependent. Either you know what's being said, so your passphrase, you could have uh, an interface asking to type your passphrase as well so that the system can uh, infer what phonemes are in what you're saying. Uh, or it can be text independent, which is a harder task because uh, you can't distinguish people uh, on the basis of, a, you, you can't take advantage of the rigid phonetic structure of the, of the passphrase. Uh, this type of system must be robust against spoofing. If somebody else plays a recording of your voice, it has to be resistant to that. Uh, must, be, must be resistant to noise and room conditions. If your service is access to banking through a mobile phone, people could be anywhere. They could be in a reverberant room, they could be in a crowd, they could be anywhere, so it's got to be uh, noise uh, resistant. Um, it has to be uh, able to work with every language. So again, you may or may not be able to uh, take advantage of a finite uh, phoneme set of uh, English versus uh, Indian versus other you know, Chinese language and so on. Um, the state of the art uh, nowadays still mixes uh, DNNs and linear algebra. So this is an example of a uh, speech recognition uh, system where you have a, a front end uh, which is called uh, X vector. So X vector is based on DNNs and the, the DNNs are trained to uh, uh, find a space where, uh, which removes all the noise and room contributions and only keeps the directions which maximally, maximally uh, separate, separate the, the, the speech from various people. Uh, and then for the scoring, you use PLDA, which is um, a probabilistic linear discriminant analysis, which is uh, based on linear algebra to find a projection where your different speakers are being, again, maximally separated. Uh, but end-to-end -end systems are starting to emerge. So uh, I pointed uh, two uh, publications here on archive from 2016 and 2018, where people are uh, getting rid even of the of the PLDA um, to make end-to-end uh, -end systems. Uh, but the idea here, uh, apart from the fact that this is one of the applications, is that. Uh, uh, the task can be very diverse, so you have to be precise on what is it, how much uh, 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 audio you're dealing with, uh, and um, uh, the old school kind of methods based on algebra and so on are being phased out, uh, and and end to end DNNs are replacing them. Let's look at music recognition. So uh, again, music recognition is not just one task, it's a variety of tasks. Uh, you have fingerprinting, query, query by humming, genre classification, uh, beat detection, mood detection, all sorts of things, automatic score transcription. So it's really a variety of things that you can do. Uh, music itself is structured by the musical score and by cultural rules. So in Chinese music, you have the pentatonic scale. Uh, if you're playing blues, it's a completely different uh, chords and, and, and scale. Uh, so to a large extent, it's shaped by uh, uh, music culture of, uh, of subculture of some sort. Uh, as I said, music uh, recognition tasks vary uh, uh, and, and vary in difficulty as well. So that's where you have to be clear about what uh, problem you're trying to solve. Uh, genre recognition in a mu music player application is going to use clean recordings. The, the tracks that you bought from uh, iTunes, Spotify or so on is going to deal directly with that with clean audio. Uh, whereas if you do fingerprinting in a bar, you're going to have a noisy background. If you do fingerprinting in a nightclub, what's that music playing? You're going to have lots of bubble noise as well around it. Uh, so in terms of uh, requirements for noise robustness, it's a completely different problem. Um, and query by humming pushes the difficulty even further because uh, the timbre differs. The, the way your voice is going to sound when you, when you sing a Shakira song is not going to sound like the whatever electric guitar or brass which is in the music. Um, so you have to be clear about your application to know what is it that you're up against. Um, this has been, music recognition was traditionally dominated by spectrum-based features, for example, the chroma features, which are, uh, which locate the filters that you use for analysis where the notes should be and kind of uh, exploit these uh, harmonic and cultural rules about music. Uh, but again, the DNNs are coming, so uh, this is an example. Um, uh, it's an article from Google, no playing continuous low power music recognition, where they train an end-to-end -end DNN uh, to uh, do uh, music detection, uh, not using uh, the traditional fingerprinting, uh, spectrum-based fingerprinting techniques anymore, using a stack of uh, convolution, uh, 2D convolutions, uh, and a few other layers uh, to achieve flattening and full connection and stuff to, for the, the final decision. So again, that's an example of software 2.0 for uh, music, uh, music detection. 
Um, sound source separation, so another task, uh, it's, again it's a variety of tasks. You could want to do music demixing if you have a track but you don't have the master recordings of each instrument separately, you might want to come back to each, each instrument separately. Uh, so that's music demixing. You could want to do uh, speech denoising or separation, so if you're in a noisy room you might want a system which is able to focus on your speech and eliminate all the background noise to improve as a front end to uh, uh, speech recognition or another system or uh, commands. Um, you might want to, pr to do special processing, beamforming, so isolate certain directions where the, the sound is coming from. If you have a microphone array then you can start playing also with uh, special cues about the sound. Uh, uh, and and uh, again, you have to be clear. Whereas you you're dealing with something which ha which has a microphone array, so many microphones. The Amazon Echo has, I think, uh, eight uh, microphones in the in the crown of the device. <coughs> um, uh, or if you're dealing with stereo uh, capture, where you have a standard two microphones recording, or uh, worst case scenario for uh, for uh, sound source separation, you have only one microphone, and many consumer devices have only one mono microphone still. Uh, that's really difficult to separate sounds if you have only one recording, if you have a mono recording of sounds. Uh, this type of domain uh, has been traditionally dominated by linear algebra, so independent component analysis used to be a big thing, then for the past five I would say 5-10 years they used to, there was a thing called non-negative matrix factorization which was also algebraic opera operations to formulate the problem of sound separation with matrix multiplications and ensuring some uh, properties desirable for audio were respected so non-negativity was about having always positive energy, never negative energy and so on. Uh, but nowadays guess what? Again, this is an example of uh, a network architecture for single channel deep clustering, multi channel deep clustering. Wang ICAS 2018, fairly fresh, uh, where you use um, bidirectional uh, recurrent LSTM neural networks, uh, stacks of these things with a linear neural network at the end, uh, sigmoid and unit norm, and then you have your decision about sound separation. So that is getting uh, you know, uh, overtaken by neural networks as well in a software 2.0 fashion. Uh, sound scenes and image recognition, so I cannot, I'm not allowed to tell you what uh, Audio Analytic is doing, but I, I'm allowed to tell you what other people are doing. Um, <coughs> so here, uh, for the problem of sound recognition, you don't have a music score, you don't have language to structure the things that you're, that you're dealing with. If I make that kind of sound, or even that kind of sound, nothing in the room was predicting that I was going to do that, unless you've seen my talk that I did two years ago when I was using the same trick, but it's, it, there is not as much um, uh, prediction power and structure as there is in speech or music. Anything can happen anytime. And um, as I said earlier, with the crash and banging sounds, the acoustic properties can be very diverse. Whereas speech is produced by the vocal tract, music is produced by music instruments, which are pretty much most of them resonators apart from drums. Uh, you could have all sorts of production processes uh, for, uh, for, for the general sounds, which have nothing to do with resonant uh, phenomena. Uh, so it's quite a difficult problem, but it's, it's a very interesting one. Uh, you have two main tasks in sound scenes and event recognition. Uh, you have sound event recognition. What is it? Is it a dog? Is it a kitchen sound? Is it frying egg? Is it only Barbara? Uh, and you also have acoustic scene recognition. So sounds like you are in a train. Can you infer uh, uh, context information from sounds? So can you infer, for example, location? If you're in a restaurant, you're going to have bubble noise and so on. So not trying to pinpoint a particular event, uh, uh, trying to get information about the context. So uh, let's take an example, which is the comparative evaluation uh, DKs. DKs is an evaluation campaign where the DKs committee uh, or DKs participants, DKs organizers of each task give uh, the same data set to all the participants and participants uh, throw their best knowledge and best system at it and, and we do a comparison at the end of the, of the DKs uh, to see which system performs best on the, on the various tasks. Task two um, is traditionally the detection of rare events. Um, so in 2017 that was was detection of baby cry, glass break, and gunshots in background noise. Uh, and the architecture which won this type of task is called convolutive recursive neural networks, uh, CRNNs, which perform best. So, and again, it's an uh, instance of software 
2.0 where you have a variety of layers uh, assuming various tasks so uh, you have from the spectrogram input you have a convolution frequency map pooling and stacking to do feature extraction then you have recurrent layers to pull some of the uh, long-term information uh, out of that and then you have a feed forward activation and predictions to do the final decision uh, so this is was the system from uh, Emre Shakir and Thomas Vietanen from Tampere University of Technology this is a system which was presented by a Korean team where they were doing something fairly similar but they were using uh, 1D convolution instead of uh, longer term convolution uh, to make their system able to work on in, a, in a continuous uh, um, way uh, with, with an audio stream rather than over a snippet of 30 seconds I think that was um, but again it's uh, you have one layer which is meant to do the feature extraction one which is meant to do with a recursive uh, network to do the long term um, uh, information and then a final uh, decision layer um, to, to, to finally tell you this is this sound or that sound. Right, I, I don't really want to uh, 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 leave it at the kind of inventory of audio tasks. This is going to become boring, but I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, three other tasks. So emotion recognition, um, the emotion categories might be application dependent. Um, so uh, traditionally, the four main emotions are uh, anger, fear, sadness, uh, and uh, happiness. Uh, but you might have other categories. Maybe your application is just about detecting when people are happy, or maybe your application is about satisfaction, uh, or maybe so. There is a whole spectrum of, of possible uh, emotions, and there is not always agreement on what the uh, emotion labels should be, uh, depending on the task. It might rely on the detection of paralinguistic speech. So paralinguistic speech is all the sounds of speech which are not uh, linguistic. So laughter is paralinguistic, screams, gasps, uh, prosodic contours might be a, a, a paralinguistic cue, um, vocal effort. If I speak like this, it's more likely to be uh, anger or, uh, or uh, I don't know, political speech, <laughs> say, uh, or something like that. Uh, so. Um, um, so, um, recognition rates uh, are fairly low compared to speech recognition. Most publications quote recognition 60%, 70%, but that's fair enough given that the evaluation itself is difficult. Uh, because of it's difficult to begin with to reach an agreement. Humans themselves uh, are, uh, would have this kind of uh, uh, accuracy when uh, being asked to tell what's the emotion in, in uh, speech uh, snippets. Um, and it's difficult to do that only from the acoustics, the linguistic content also, also matters. Um, another application is uh, sound to intent or speech to intent. Uh, so the idea here is that text transcription accuracy does not necessarily matter as much as semantic for voice comments. If you want to order a pizza, please uh, Siri order a pizza. Uh, uh, you don't uh, need to be accurate for the whole sentence as long as you rec recognize order and pizza and that uh, is enough semantics to actually trigger uh, the action. So it used to be that uh, speech to intensity say were quote quote just bad speech transcription systems. Um, uh, and that can work for certain tasks. Um, but nowadays, because DNNs are able to do that complex function, you don't necessarily need to go via the text transcription to do a speech to intent. Uh, if you know how the, the, the um, ordering uh, system is going to work, or if you know what you want to achieve in terms of intentions in your, uh, in your system, in your smart assistant, you can map that directly from the audio um, with a neural network. Uh, uh, so the, the mother of all audio tasks is audio indexing, also known as uh, diarization. So uh, that's where you have uh, large collections of audio recordings, for example, the whole BBC archives or uh, whatnot, uh, and you want to uh, index, tag, or subtitle those large amounts of audio recordings. Um, YouTube being example also of, of large amount of, of data with, with audio in it. And so uh, the problem there is to achieve segmentation. So what's, find what's in the soundtracks and where it is. Uh, for example, where are people speaking? How many people are speaking? Which uh, music pieces are playing, either separately as jingles or in the background? Um, you might have advertisements coming where you have a different type of contents. Uh, which are the sounds? So in, in TV programs, you don't have only speech and music. You also have whatnot, helicopters, um, dropping microphone, whatnot. Uh, and this pools all the other domains of uh, speech recognition, speaker recognition, and so on in some kind of super task, which is uh, audio indexing. 
So let's try uh, indeed to not leave it at just an inventory of audio applications. Uh, what kind of insights uh, are kind of generic across all of that? Uh, one very important uh, insight is that system evaluation matters. And open evaluations such as the DKS Challenge are good at supplying reference databases. If you want to start in a particular audio task, it's good to start with one of the public tasks available. Um, and fostering the development of novel ideas and of for algorithms and methods. And pretty much every audio task has their public uh, evaluation. So for speech recognition, the DARPA evaluations used to pull the domain forward. For speech synthesis, Blizzard Challenge has been around for probably 15 years uh, pulling forward the speech synthesis domain. Um, uh, a speech for speech recognition, speaker recognition, sorry, the NIST uh, speaker recognition evaluation have been around for a long, long time. Musical audio source separation is a CISEC evaluation, so on and so forth. Sound synthesis and event recognition, that's the DKs. So uh, they are a good entry point into the domain in that if you want to have a kind of snapshot of the state of the art or, or what uh, people think the state of the art is and you have access to a database to, uh, to start uh, experiments, uh, that's a very, very good uh, to start with uh, looking at the literature stemming from one of these. Now, uh, however, open evaluation sometimes bias the problem significantly. So the database that you will get with one of these, uh, is it really, um, how, how close or far is it to a real world task? Uh, was it just whatever data was uh, affordable and available to uh, organize the evaluation? This is a question that you have to ask yourself, especially in the industry. We cannot use uh, uh, some of this data because it's not realistic uh, compared to the application. If you f uh, find, for example, uh, uh, glass break sounds on free sounds or uh, in uh, audio set, they have nothing to do with the sound of breaking a real window. Breaking a real window is, is, is super loud and so on. So, so uh, we did have to record really, really life data to be able to do what we're doing in this really. So you have to take those kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, public databases with a pinch of salt and sort of be critical about them. Some of them are going to be okay. So Blizzard Challenge, the, the, the databases are perfectly fine for a speaker, a speech sorry, synthesis. Uh, DARPA is good enough for speech recognition, but uh, in some cases like DKs, you, you can't really use audio set to make a, a, a valid sound recognition system. Um, so the also one uh, effect of the public uh, evaluations is that the presenting systems might be seeking to win the competitive evaluation rather than solving the problem. And sometimes uh, the effect is that people try to tune their algorithm through kind of cooking recipes like, oh, let's do a bit of uh, data augmentation in a way we're not really going to question if that's realistic or not. We're just going to do, oh yeah, it improves the system. We don't know why, but it wins the evaluation, so we're happy. So again, uh, 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 you have to be a bit kind of critical about that and see, okay, right, this is, uh, I understand what the system is doing. I understand that data augmentation is helping and so on. Uh, so you might want to pick and mix, but be a bit, keep your uh, critical sense about the systems that you see in these evaluations. And also one question is, are comparative evaluation metrics relevant to user experience? There is a thing in sound recognition which is called area under curve, which is uh, a way to uh, uh, include both the true positive and false positive evaluation into one single curve. So uh, area under curve is good to uh, rank systems. If uh, system uh, A has uh, a, a bigger area under curve than system B, then system A is better. But uh, area under curve is not really interpretable in terms of user experience for sound recognition what's going to make user opinion about your system is more how many false positives does it, does it make? Uh, uh, is it uh, uh, recognizing the important sounds accurately? That kind of thing. Um, evaluation in real conditions is hard and costly, but necessary for industrial success. Uh, so would the algorithm fit in real-time operation on a consumer chip? That's a, that's a relevant thing. Sometimes you see uh, algorithms published which would need a supercomputer to run or a cloud. You don't always have access to the cloud. Sometimes you want to run your sound recognition on device. So it's important to, uh, to take care of your, uh, of your uh, computational cost. Uh, which audio capture uh, or computational hardware is needed? Sometimes you just have a consumer-grade microphone which is noisy, distorted and so on. You have to deal with that. Um, were the neglected effects actually significant? So that's about uh, 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 making sure that your uh, room effects are represented accurately in your data, so on and so forth. And very, very importantly, there is that question, is your AI system really doing what you think it is doing? So once upon a time, Clever Hans was a horse who could do mathematics. There is a researcher called Bob Sturm who published about that. 
And the idea is that the, that horse, uh, the, the owner of the horse was uh, asking the horse how much is 2 plus 2, and the horse would tap the hoof four times. Uh, and people were like, oh my god, this, this horse can do mathematics. So one uh, researcher, Oscar Funk, uh, 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 analyzed what the horse was actually doing and found out that the horse was actually um, uh, locking on uh, the, the, the audience and the own horse's owner's reactions when the solution was approaching. People were going, ah! and, and so uh, the horse was picking up on that and, and stopping to tap the hoof. And the owner of the horse himself was not aware that the horse was, was doing human reaction classification rather than mathematics. Mathematics. And Bob Sturm proved that for some of the uh, music evaluations which were where the systems were claiming to do genre recognition, the systems were actually doing tempo classification. If you were perturbating, slowing down the blues where it was still blues uh, but slower, or uh, uh, speeding up the waltz where it was still waltz but faster, uh, many of the systems' performance were, performances were perturbating and falling down. So it's really important to uh, verify that your system uh, is doing what you really think is doing. If you do, are not careful about the way you record and manage your data, you could be doing a room classifier rather than a sound classifier. If you were recording uh, all your dogs in room A and all your babies in room B, you might be classifying the rooms rather than dogs versus babies. Uh, so that's really, really important to be, to be careful about that. Right, so uh, takeaways from, from this talk. Uh, DNNs have become ubiquitous. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of provocatively packaging them into a hamburger. You don't even have to ask yourself, just, just go for the DNN. But at the same time, it's for, for uh, uh, reasonable uh, uh, reasons, uh, which is uh, they are nonlinear, they can approximate any function, so they are tractable and so on. So there are reasons for the success of, uh, and the ubiquity of, of DNNs. Uh, however, the, uh, so if, you, if you, uh, your, your audio domain knowledge matters significantly, uh, most of your uh, audio tasks are big machines, complex things that you want to achieve, and uh, it's important to define which variant of the problem or, or the task you are trying to solve. Uh, do you have a mono recording? Do you have a stereo? Or do you have an array of microphones? How noise robust you, does your system need to be? What are the sources of acoustic variability? Is it how much how much variability is there in dog bark? How much in baby? Are all the babies crying the same or are they crying different? Are all the people speaking the same or do they have accents or do you want to make a monolingual system or a, you know bilingual system? Um, and so laying out the machine learning task clearly is very very important to, to, to be able to, to solve your problem with AI. Uh, also, in the sense of software 2.0, that doesn't mean you, you don't need to know anything about uh, DNNs. You need to know stuff about DNNs. Uh, you need to know which uh, DNNs, what the DNNs are set to achieve. So having some kind of high-level uh, ID of uh, uh, the blocks in your system, so feature extraction, uh, acoustic modeling, long-term modeling, and so on, and uh, design an, uh, an optimal uh, DNN architecture, or optimize iteratively your DNN architecture to achieve uh, those different functions that are in your, in your in your macroscopic view of the system. Data itself is a parameter. Realistic data matters and must represent the biases of reality. Uh, part of the domain expertise now is about judging the coverage and relevance of audio availability in the machine learning data sets. You, you, again, so it's, uh, if you don't do that, you might be classifying rooms instead of classifying uh, sounds, or uh, yeah, you might have some bias that, that you didn't think about. So it's really important to understand what's happening into your data and what are the sources of variability. Uh, realistic evaluations and meaningful metrics are crucial. Um, comparative metrics may not be relevant to user experience, so depending what you want to, to achieve, if you want to uh, make a useful application or industrial application, you have to get to the user. And it's not just about classification accuracy, uh, it might be about other factors which uh, impact user experience. Sometimes you might uh, get away with a system which is suboptimal as long as users are happy about it. Uh, sometimes the, uh, 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 you think you had a good system and then when you put it in the field you discover that people are not happy because 60% is not good enough and so on. Uh, in our field of audio recognitions, we must go up to 98% uh, accuracy for people to be happy about the system. It's not a joke. This is hard and we achieve it. And the system is a horse until proven otherwise. It's really important to check uh, that your system is not uh, uh, doing something else that you think. It's not modeling some kind of bias rather than modeling the actual task. Thank you very much. By the way, we are, we are hiring, so if you're uh, finishing your PhD or your uh, postdoc contract and you're interested in uh, applying AI to audio, please uh, uh, have a look at our careers website. Thank you.